Oh, yeah, good morning. Um, look, just uh, thank you very much from the time group for, for coming along to this. I know a few of you have travelled uh, from across the country and some of you have crossed over from the other side of, uh, of the bridge and that's probably just as hard as travelling from Dunedin. So um, thank you very much for, for coming here. But my name's James Nation and Chief Executive at the Time Group. And from my perspective, it's, it's great to put some um, faces to the names of a lot of you that I, I haven't met before. Um, I know a lot of you as well, but certainly there are a few that I didn't know, and it's really good to, to see you here, so thank you. I uh, just, I'll introduce our team. Uh, there's a few of us here, and there's a few back in the office as well, but uh, we've got Lauren Perry here, who is, a lot of you will know from the design, content, and training perspective. Um, Lauren has run away from Trump and has her residency, so um, we're pretty happy about that the last couple of months. And then we have Graham Berber, who uh, looks after a couple of fracking clients. He's uh, the master of everything, so general manager, looks after a few other products as well, um, and is certainly um, heavily involved in, in fracking. What else have we got? We've got Richard Fogarty, who is looks after a lot of the sports here actually. Um, does all the meeting and greeting and generally uh, all around nice guy, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you put it on though, you put it on. My job is done. Yep. We've got Steve Stanley down the back, Stan. Uh, he's our, our resident North Islander that we can give some grief. Um, so he's Tauranga based and again, uh, works with a lot of the sports. We've got Dan and Dan is our marketing guy, Dan Thomas and capture this footage, but he puts out communications and Bracken, the new Bracken website and stuff, he's, he's heavily involved in that. And then today we've got India, who is our intern for summer and is going to support Dan around social marketing. So third year going into fourth year commerce Third year. Yeah, yeah, nice. And starting pretty soon with us down in Dunedin, but as an Auckland local, so brought it along today. Look, today is just about... Um, well, some comments, some, some conversations that we've had with you guys was around uh, getting together, getting together with other sporting organisations that are using Bracken and, and, and sharing knowledge. So us providing some, some knowledge, but also you guys getting to know each other because you're all essentially doing the same thing. You're all trying to develop your, your coaching staff, your officials, your parents, your players, your um, volunteers, whoever it may be. You're all trying to do the same thing, um, and you all have different ways of approaching it. And I think it's much better with peer network, um, feeding off each other. And yes, we're always there to help, but um, we will, I guess this was our, our answer to that, was getting you all in a room, giving some of our knowledge so that you're getting the most out of the Bracken platform, um, but also you guys getting to know each other that are in your vicinity and Hopefully, if you need to, you can call them up and, and have a conversation. Look, and we, we realise that you guys have a choice as well. So a choice in, in the platform that you use for delivering um, all your learning material. And, and we thank you for that, that you, you're with Bracken. Um, and we, we want to give something back to you. And it is all around um, learning and giving you that training. So Now today, I've got um, a brief intro from me. Um, we're going to go into Lauren and Stan doing some training just around e-learning trends and what that means and, and how you can use that in Bracken. We'll have a, a break and mix and mingle and then we'll come back for a, a facilitated session where we'll just cover off um, a number of questions but over the course of the training if you have any questions just write them down and, and maybe um, have a chat to actually Stan at the break or just pass them over or hold on to them. Okay, just a wee bit about the Tarn Group and a wee bit of context, I guess, and apologies if you know the story. Uh, I won't go into it in too much detail, but Silicon Coach is the founding of the company um, and product. So Joe Morrison came out of Z School and it was all around uh, biomechanical analysis, so sports video analysis, and that was 20 odd years ago. Went around the world, um, that's morphed and actually Graham's looking after it and it's had a bit of a renaissance recently and um, kind of I think around 
people using their smartphones and just having access to video. So it's something that we haven't put a lot of effort into and it's, it's sort of taken off again, So which is great. Um, and so that sits there. A spin out of that is dialed in motion. So if you go to the shoe clinic and run on a treadmill, the, the video software is our stuff in the background that they uh, video your, your gait. Uh, for bikes, so go to an Avanti store, uh, the bike fitting there, that's our software sitting in the background. Another spin out of that is, is PO Data Solutions. So we have Kara who lives in the US. She's a whoa, she's a biomedical engineer by trade. Um, and PO Data is around prosthetics and orthotics. So same kind of thing as, as fitting limbs, gait analysis and uh, very much a, a clinical setting. So Cara looks after that. The main markets are Australia, uh, the US, and into the UK as well. Aranui is a, a recent one and <clears throat> a recent product, and it's a partnership with a company in Auckland called Evaluation Associates. It's a teacher appraisal system. So rather than pushing information out, um, it's, it's pulling information in. So as a teacher, they have to keep up their registration annually They've got 12 criteria, and basically it's, it's helping them sort through all the evidence um, of their teaching practice and put it into a, a nice collated um, e-portfolio. And so that's been around a uh, year and a half, and I think we've signed up 160 schools so far across New Zealand. And then there's Bracken, which you guys uh, know all too well, but I will talk to that a wee bit. So, look, Bracken is our accelerated learning platform. Sports is a big part of it. Um, we did a breakdown of all our customers. It's about 33% of our customers is sport. So yes, there's New Zealand, but there's also a number of Australian ones, so, which Graham looks after. So we have Australian University Sports, we have Victoria Cricket, and recently we signed up Australian Cycling. So um, there's very much that, that sports, which we're all passionate about, um, and we, we love dealing with sporting organisations. We also go into the corporate area, so corporate health and safety, induction, onboarding, um, food safety, uh, a lot of different areas that they go into competency-based training. Um, so we deal directly with law firms, with trucking firms, um, building companies, and also with a, we partner with a, a risk management system out of uh, Christchurch who gets us access with the e-learning part of their, their whole database um, health and safety system. And then we're, we're education as well, so uh, pretty much primary, secondary and tertiary education. We are involved in that through Ministry of Education contracts, uh, through partnerships and into Otago Polytechnic and um, Med School at Otago University. So a really wide uh, variety of, of clients that are using, using Bracken. Look, just, um, just one thing about Bracken. Um, and I think it's, it's really important for you guys to, to understand where we're going with it. We, probably about two months ago, sat down and, as a group and tried to work out what Bracken was about and what we stood for. And we, I guess as management and, and trying to understand how we put features into it and we're going with it, I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page. So we, we looked at our five-year strategy and determined what Bracken's about, our, our purpose really. Why do we exist um, as the Tarn group, but also with Bracken? And the overwhelming theme was, was around learning. So it came out really clearly that we're about learning. And so our, our purpose essentially is that we're an enabler for you guys as our customers to pass on learning to your people. So using Bracken as one of the, the methods of developing your people. So whether it's sports organizations or whether it's corporates, that theme ran true. So that's really important for us that we, we know that we're into learning and that guides us in terms of what we're doing with Bracken as a platform to make your lives easier as, I guess, the, the people in charge of developing your, your users, so your officials, your coaches, whoever it may be. So just um, some of the stuff that we are looking at in terms of Bracken and I, I guess our roadmap of, of features and I know Lauren and Stan will talk to this today but it's all about trying to make it as simple as possible for your, for your people, your users, 
for you as administrators or authors. And um, so as users, it's around single sign-on. So uh, across sports organizations, across corporates, um, generally there's people are using multiple username passwords. And um, a number of organizations are starting to do their digital strategy and implement systems and, and trying to have it all in one central area. Us as Bracken, we're very much a plug into that. So we're not the be all and end all that sits in the middle. We plug into whatever it is in the middle, whether it's your member management system or your customer relationship, your CRM. Um, essentially, we bolt into that. And that single sign on is somebody's got one username, one password, it gets them access to all the things that they need to have access to. Um, user centered is very much around putting the learner at the forefront. So whether it's a coach, whether it's a an athlete, um, they're getting the information that they need, um, ideally in the easiest possible way. And the other one is responsive design, which again will be covered off, but people these days are really using their phones. Okay, so um, depending on what the situation is, is making sure that the content that they have is responsive and it can be viewed on the phone and it's no different to how it would be on the, on the laptop or desktop. So giving them options to, to do the training when and where they need it, which is the power of online learning. As an organization, we're about training. And I think if you need more training, and we'll do obviously some training today, but as individuals and you want more training as an author, then please get in touch. And we want to make sure that you've got the skills and you're able to use the system to get the most out of it. Um, so we want to make sure you're, you're adequately trained um, again, integration, so being that bolt into a, a big system, um, that's, that's what we're, we're aiming for. So I know gym sports and, and yachting were going down the track of dealing with the Microsoft stuff that they're using and integrating that. Um, getting more out of your system, uh, getting your users into the system easily, um, that's all around whether it's one system, just a, one user sending an email, whether it's a, a cluster of your your coaches that you're wanting to get into the system, dealing with those as simply as possible, or whether it's 200 people or 1,000 people that you need to get into the system, being able to bulk upload those. So again, as an administrator, making that really simple for you to, to do that. And then the final one is just the authoring environment. So when we make it responsive, at the moment as an author, it's, it's quite um, time consuming to be making uh, modules and checking it for how it looks on the smartphone view. So we just need to streamline that, and, uh, and that's certainly some attention that we're gonna be giving in the not too distant future. So that's that's kind of where we're, we're going, and we'll go into a bit more depth with Stan and Lauren. The other part is, is feedback. And we love to hear feedback, and we don't wanna hear good feedback, well, we like to hear good feedback, but the, the feedback that you guys have yourselves and how you use the system, um, especially what doesn't work, is really important for us to hear because we make some assumptions, we know how it works, but actually you guys are hearing it from your own, at your own level, but also your end users. And we, to a degree, don't get to hear too much from the end users. So if you get feedback from your end users, um, please push that back to us, okay, especially when it's it's changes that we could make to make it easier for them. I think it's really important. Look, that's it for me. Um, thank you very much for coming along. I really appreciate it. And um, it's, it's great to have you all in this room. So, Lauren, over to you. Thank you. So most of you, I think I recognize, I may not have met all of you uh, via Skype for the first part of this place, but um, I am responsible for instructional design at the Cohen Group. So I lead a team of two, and what we look at is how does our system work. Um, that includes how does it look, but a lot of what we focus on is how does it work. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you about today is um, essentially personalized learning, but we're going to call it tailored learning because it actually includes quite a few other concepts. So with tailored learning, this is something that has come about as a response to what people commonly refer to as traditional education.
traditional education is very similar to what you are in right now. Um, it's set to a time. It is irrelevant of your experience level. So if you are a beginner, you're going to get lost. And if you are an expert, you're going to be bored. And that is something that a lot of people wanted to change. There are a lot of governments that are going with the no student left behind kind of a movement. And that's just in an effort to get everyone on the same playing field um, and to give them an experience that works for them. Everybody learns differently, so it's important to kind of try and cater to those people in as many different ways as you can. Now, personalized learning is essentially delivering the right learning content to the right person at the right time. Now, when you use an online system, you're delivering the right learning content, hopefully, and you're delivering it to the right person. It's all about the timing. Now, with this, you'll notice in your personal life that you get personalized things all the time. So if you're shopping on Amazon, um, it will decide which items it thinks you want to buy next. When you're watching movies on Netflix, it'll say, hey, you really liked this movie, so we think you're going to like this TV show as well. Facebook also <coughs> takes advantage of data that's on your mobile phone. It keeps tabs on your location, and if an emergency happens in an area near you, you get what's called a safety check. I don't know if any of you have experienced this before. It kind of blew my mind the first time I saw it, but if you're near an earthquake, it asks you to check in so that your friends and family know that you're okay. So this concept of personalization is not new to the marketing area. Um, you'll notice that all three of these companies are very big companies, and they probably have very big marketing budgets and can afford to take advantage of mass amounts of data. There is a movement that's going along that's been around for probably five or six years that is referred to as big data. And that's basically just a lot of data. And when you're dealing with a very, very big learning environment, um, if you've ever used Khan Academy, it's all about picking lots of little bits of data and using that to auto-personalize um, learning, learning content for an individual user. That is obviously something that is very um, pricey because you're looking at a lot of data management, data mining, having to store it, having to sort through it. So what we want to do today is explain to you how you can personalize stuff when you're on a budget. So personalizing education on a budget can be done by looking at the things that you actually have control over. You can control your learning objectives. So what are you trying to teach people? How are you designing that course in specific? And that includes the content complexity. How difficult is it? Um, is it good enough for a novice? Is it good enough for advanced? Having to think about how that actually works. It allows for case differences. So this is something that our system and any online learning, learning system accommodates for. If you're a fast learner, you finish it faster. If you're a slow learner, you can take your time and work your way through that material at your own pace. This is not very new to any of you. Um, and it also involves changing around the type of instruction. So we'll talk about blended learning a little bit later, but you can, you can use online learning in conjunction with a numerous different types of teaching. So that's something we'll touch on later, but it is something that you have control over when you're trying to personalize uh, the experience for your users. Now, when you're trying to personalize, I've kind of pulled out three key tips that you need to keep in mind. Um, the first one is you have to know your audience. So for you guys, you have a very broad range of users, I'm assuming. You're going to have volunteers. You'll have members of the public who know nothing about your sport but happen to have a child that wants to get into it. You will go all the way up through performance. You'll have professional athletes, professional coaches, referees, etc. So it's really, it's really important when you're looking at developing your content that you think about who you're developing it for. It helps you focus what you're trying to say. It helps you keep everything in a nice, tidy package. So is your content at the right level? If it is at a level for a performance athlete, it is probably not what you need for someone who's just getting into the sport. It helps you determine your delivery format. When you're thinking about your user base, how are, they, um, how are they accessing your information? Are they using a desktop? Are they expecting face-to-face? -face? So what devices do you need to design this for? Are they working mainly off of a smartphone? Um, do they have tablets? You need to clarify your user needs. So what do they actually need covered? Um, is the information that you're going over actually necessary? Is this stuff that they may already know from previous experience? It also helps you target your support and development. 
So this is something that is really geared on feedback. So when you run a course, it's really important, and I know it's really hard, but it's really important to get your users to engage in the feedback process. That's the only way you're gonna grow your content and improve it, is to know, is it actually doing what it's supposed to do? We can have the best of intentions when we design something, but it only, it only works when it works for the user. So it also helps you with determining how you can assist them. If your content is short somewhere, people will tell you, I would have liked to know more about this. Use that. Now, one way that you can really focus on your user base is a simple marketing exercise that's called creating a persona. Um, how many of you are familiar with creating a persona? Sweet, okay. Good, I was really hoping no one knew about this, good. So, um, when you're creating a persona, this is really common when you're marketing towards someone. And really what you guys are doing, if you're working with education, is you're marketing knowledge. That is, that's essentially what you're doing. And understanding your user base can really be affected and helped with understanding how to make a persona. Um, you want to think of a range of your different users. Uh, you can focus in on a specific course if you want, or you can focus on organization-wide. But what you want to do is think about demographic information, and you're just going to make up a person. So you can do this in your head with me. Um, demographic information, are they male, are they female? How old are they? Um, what type of education level do they have? Little stats like that. And then you work your way through to describing their normal day. Do they have children? Um, how, many, how many hours a week are they working? Where do they go for information? And this touches on what devices you need to be designing for. Are they the kind of person that hears a question and immediately Googles it on their phone? Do they think, actually my dad would know a lot about that, I'll give him a call. So how are they kind of engaging with information on a day-to-day -day basis? Do they come directly to your organization for more information? And then what type of technology do they use? Are they familiar with technology? Have they grown up with technology? The way that a five-year-old uses technology is probably way more competent than how I use technology. And that's gonna be a consistent factor with your user bases as your organizations grow and continue to age. Your user base is gonna be more and more familiar with faster and faster information. So this is something that you can do. Create multiple personas. Usually when we're working with a specific course, you try and set yourself up with about three. So you want someone who is on the lower end of the scale, they don't really know a lot, and you want someone who's on the higher end of the scale, so they're kind of familiar with what you're trying to teach them. This is really helpful when you're looking at your course content. And if you give them names, that's even better. So if I have someone named Sandy who doesn't really know a lot about what I'm trying to teach, I can discuss something with Richard, for example, and say, do you think Sandy is going to understand this? Is this going to work for her? And if both of you know that persona and their details, you can use that as a way to collaborate with your, with your coworkers in content development. So that's very, very handy, I highly recommend it. The other big thing with this is how much time does that person have? So how many of you have small children? Couple? And how much free time do you have when you get home? Not much. <laughs> so if your user base includes parents, you have to take that into account. You can't have a module that takes you three hours to get through because they don't have three hours to focus on it. Unless they have a really good babysitter or a really understanding spouse and a really quiet room in their house. <laughs> right, now the next thing that you can do for personalization is work on the flow. Um, how many of you, being that you're sports enthusiasts, um, understand the concept of flow or have heard of something along those lines? Yeah? Um, this is a concept that originated in the 60s 70s by a guy called Mihai Chiknitsihai, and he did a lot of research with um, artists, specifically starting out. Um, you'll have noticed it when you watch someone playing a guitar um, or playing the piano. Piano's really great because pianists get really into it and they're just like swaying and they get really sucked into what they're doing. Artists are the same way. Um, you can have someone painting something and you go back and ask them, how long do you think that took? And they would say an hour, and in reality they were there for five hours. If you've ever played a video game, similar concept. You lose track of time. So Mihai Chiknitsihai has done a lot of research in a lot of different environments, starting out with the arts, um, but he summed it up beautifully. So the concept of flow is being completely involved in an activity for its own sake. The ego falls away, time flies. Every action, movement, and thought follows inevitably from the previous one, like playing jazz. 
Your whole being is involved and you're using your skills to the utmost. This is a very high level of flow. And if you can get this with your education, you're doing really, really well. If it's been really well designed, you will get really close to this. What you want your users to do is get so sucked into what they're doing that they don't realize that they've been doing it for a long time. So if you're getting feedback that says, I didn't even know that I was taking this course for that long, then that's great, that's fantastic. Um, what we'll talk about is how you can kind of help achieve that, that state of flow. Um, this is something that has been studied for a long time and a lot of really big players in humanity actually take advantage of this concept. So the Getty Museum uses it for how you walk through their environment. Um, Swedish police use it on how their policemen and women are processing someone that they've brought in. They think about how they're walking through that building, they think about what they're discussing. When you're using it in education, it is important to keep your challenge levels appropriate. This is the key to flow in general. So if something is at the challenge level that's just above what you're capable of doing, that's when you get sucked into it. And you're like, okay, if I just keep going at this, it's gonna be great, and I'm gonna get through to the end of it, it's gonna be fantastic. And you get that sense of achievement a lot faster, and that keeps you engaged in what you're doing. One way that you can replicate that feeling in a controlled fashion is by using recommended modules. Now, Murray, I hope you don't mind, um, but we've used PGA as a screenshot example for this. So with recommended modules, what you have the ability to do is go into an individual course and recommend a module specifically to a user. So if, for example, James needed to practice modules one, two, and three, I can go in and say, James, you need to do these three. He gets a notification, you'll see, on the side over here, that you get a flag next to the pathway that you've had something recommended, and then when you're on that pathway, you get flags next to the modules that have been suggested for you. So this is something that allows you to individualize or personalize that experience for your users. It's a little bit more work on your end, but it pays dividends for the people that are using the system because they get an individual touch. They get to know that you thought about them and you said, hey, I want you to do these things because I think it's gonna help you. Now the other thing you can think about is auto-progression in a roundabout way. This is something that you're probably all doing without actually thinking about it, and it's all about leveling something. So you generally will have a beginner, an intermediate, and advanced. That's pretty common. Um, we've got a client called Tiako Live. They train shearers, and they've done the very same thing. They've just called it something different. So with their levels, they refer to them as runs. So they have a first, second, and third. Your content needs to progressively increase in difficulty, and when you do that, you maintain that level of flow all the way through. That keeps your users engaged, um, and it's really up to you. A lot of people want to block them from level to level, but if you have someone who really wants to learn that content and they're engaged with it, why would you stop them from doing it? Unless you need to collect some sort of assessment data on them. That's the only reason I can think of, because if I'm sucked into something, you want them engaged with your system, you want them coming back, you get brand recognition, you get information that's going out to the public, so let them go through it. If they, if they are progressing properly and you're testing them along the way, then there's nothing to stop them from going straight to the top. Now, the other thing um, with personalized learning is a concept called gamification. Um, this is something that gets bandied about quite a bit lately. And gamification is basically an approach to learning where you're using game mechanics. So points, achievements, competitions, leaderboards, stuff like that. Your goal is to increase intrinsic motivation. Um, anyone know what intrinsic motivation is? Internal. So intrinsic motivation is something you're doing for you. You're not doing it for a bonus. Um, you're doing it because you feel like doing it. So with gamification, you're creating that effect. Um, if you've ever played a game of Monopoly, you've been emotionally invested in it. Someone's probably thrown something on the ground at some point, or you know someone that's done that. What you didn't know is when you're playing Monopoly, you're actually learning about finances, you're learning about the real estate market, you're learning about bargaining. That is a concept that's been around for a long time, but it's not had a name. <laughs> so now it has a name. Um, when you're doing this with your content, what you need to think about is remember to really think it through. Make sure your content flows nicely, it makes sense. Um, when you're combining it with gamification, it needs to work the way that it's gonna suit your users best. So when you're developing it, you wanna focus on quality, not quantity. 
Quantity gets boring. I've probably been talking for a while. It's a little bit boring, isn't it? Quality is fantastic. Quality will keep you engaged with it. Now, testing is vital, and that is vital even when you're not including gamification in your systems. Testing is very important because A, it tells you if your product's working properly. B, it allows you collect, to collect important feedback. So if it's not working, why? Um, why didn't my user like it? Why did they get stuck here? What were their frustration points? This is something that we really need as well. So if you find that something's not working on your end, you need to let us know and we can help you out with it or design something that's gonna suit your users better. Um, an example of how we include gamification in our system is use of certificates. So right now these are attached to a pathway. Um, we are in the middle of developing a module-based certificate that is attached to an individual module, which I think you'd be interested in this. Um, and it works on a PDF basis. So this means that you're allowed to include a letter at the beginning to say, hey, we really appreciate the time you've taken to do this. Um, and then it follows with the certificate on the end. So it's a much more straightforward process for your user. And it allows you to include multiple certificates based on individual modules within that pathway. So that's something that will be coming up soon. We, as you're probably aware, do capture progress. And this is something that most game users will be relatively familiar with. You want to know how far you are through that challenge. You want to know how close you are to getting to the end or how close you are to getting extra points. So this is something that um, your users can engage with already. You have a progress bar that fills, and you can look along the bottom to see how you're scoring on all the modules for that pathway. This is something the uh, facilitators for this zone have access to as well. So that allows you to track your users and determine how are they doing, are they getting stuck somewhere, how can I help them? Because we all know collecting feedback is harsh. So sometimes you have to go and find it. <laughs> so that's a good place to look. Um, so really in short, when you're looking at personalizing your learning environments, understand your users. That is key, that's number one, always. Um, number two, is this gonna flow for them? Are my challenge levels set appropriately? And then number three, how can I make it fun? How can I include something that's gonna keep them involved and give them something they can take away from that experience and get them wanting more as well? Um, yeah, so that's me. And I believe Stan is up next for the questions. Thank you for your time. Good to see lots of you writing notes, the ones that did must know there's an exam at the end. <laughs> um, we'll be sending out a PDF of this. Dan will send out a PDF of this talk soon. All the bits and pieces on the slide you'll get uh, after the talk. What I'd like to talk to you today is on reflective practice. So, reflective practice, reflect, reflective practice is nothing new. It's been done since the dawn of time, really. People thinking back on what they did, their experiences, and thinking how they could improve on it. It seems to be that it's becoming a more formal and systematic process more recently. For athletes refining technique, you know, they do the technique, they think about what they did, how they could improve it, how they can improve it next time, uh, game technique, game strategies, etc. But what we're seeing is one of the trends is it's being used more and more for coaching. So it could be coaches reflecting on what they said and did. Again, the aim is to make them better coaches. But also coaches who coach coaching. Sounds like something from Dr. Seuss. But teaching a coach to be a coach is a skill in itself, over and above the skill of being a coach. And also we're seeing more and more people issuing qualifications where they're requiring people to reflect on what they did and how they did it. The trouble is, they're all pretty much using words. They're either remembering how the coaching session went and writing it down, or they're getting someone else to describe it as they go. The trouble is words don't really capture everything that goes on. They don't capture non-verbal cues, they don't uh, capture inflections. What were you thinking? As opposed to, what were you thinking? Yeah, the same words, completely different tone and outcome. So, if people can't understand the words and they're not understanding the words that have been given to them to capture this communication or this event or this experience, 
they can't picture it in their minds. And if they can't picture it in their minds, like Einstein said, they can't understand it. So th this is where we would say, well, why not get a whole lot of pictures, put them together one after another, and use a video. So why not just video what happened, and then talk about it? So we have a tool, and it's already in Bracken, although we're starting to really um, single it out. It's just about a product on itself, but it, it will always be available in Bracken. And it's really quite unique to Bracken. No other learning management system has it, and there's very few video reflective practice tools out there at all. It's called video-based reflection at the moment, and that's a working title, so if anyone has a better name for it, if you're struggling with new names, uh, let me know. But we'll call it video-based reflection for now. So how does it work? Well, just video the performance. Uh, we have an iOS app. We have an Android app that's in development at the moment. There's a camcorder, stills camera, captures video, um, webcam, whatever vid captures video. You can get it into the system and then reflect on its performance, or on, on your performance. The system pushes it up to the cloud, which makes it more accessible. And really, if you stop there, you could just do that with your app in Dropbox. But where we take it further, and we think where it's really critical, is we give tools that help in the reflective process and sort of give more structure to the, to the reflective process. And then it can be, importantly, shared with others in a secure environment. In fact, if we look at the features, it's a safe and secure environment, just like Bracken, you have to be logged in to use it. It in integrates with other LMS systems, because it's part of Bracken, just like James mentioned before, and I'll talk about integration in a bit more detail later. It's paperless, it's cloud-based, so it's accessible, it's accessible on multiple devices, mobile, desktop, tablet, etc. Simple to use, and it has these advanced annotation tools. We'll look at those in a second. So the process is really quite simple. You record it, you reflect on it, and then you timestamp the video where critical things happen. And then if you want to, you can go to another stage higher and collaborate with others. You can have other people looking at your reflections. So how would it look? Well, this is what it looks like on the screen. So here we have the video, and then the video controller down here. And some of you may have seen this tool on our system used for technique analysis. And it's really the same basic tool. The drawing tools and annotation tools down here. And over here, we have the normal sort of forum structure. Someone makes a post, someone replies to it, and on it goes. But in our system, the two are linked. So the key points in the video are captured along with the comments and type in and, and saved along here. So this could be an example for a rather dance. They could be reflecting on their performance. But if we look at it more for coaching, we can start looking at the pedagogy of you know, how many positive comments were made, how many negative comments, how, how much uh, constructive criticism was there, was there information overload. And this can all be done in a systematic way where you're actually reporting on what happened. Because our ability to remember what happened after the fact is really bad. And it's generally swayed by the extremes, like the really goods and the really bads. You don't remember the bulk in the middle, because we can't remember that much stuff. Um, and even if someone's scribing along, again, they're using words to record a logbook of what you did in the session. This thing can be shared out with others, just click on the sharing button, and other people can look at your reflections. You know, were you too critical on yourself? Were you not critical enough? Did you miss this bit? And you can even reflect on the reflection. You see those two mirror things where you're looking forever into infinity. So it can be used on a variety of levels. Self-reflection, so just a coach, directly looking at themselves. Shared reflection, getting more into the, um, the learning side of it. And then there could even be a legal part, uh, especially if there's some assessment involved. Yeah, this is what actually happened. This was their coaching performance when they were going through a qualification. It's not what someone wrote down that they thought they saw they did. This is what they actually did. So to bring it back, 
rather than just mentally reflecting on what they do, people do, um, on athletes or coaches, etc. Use the same concept, but use the video tool as part of it. And it seems quite simple, but it's actually a really powerful tool to use, and it's intentional. That's why we try to keep it simple. When it comes to qualifications, people could submit qualifications, a video, and them reflecting on the video as a qualification. They could share it with their mentor or their tutor or whatever, rather than trying to again use words in an essay to describe how they thought the session went. This proof of what happened, this proof of what the person reflected on. So how might, how might it look? So just Have a look at it live. So this is running live now, and um, here's an analysis I did just before. So all I did was stood at the back, and it's pretty hard to see. This is James's intro, half an hour ago. So we were going to, we were going to put some duct tape around because James tends to walk and he talks and we're going to lock the doors and put some tape around just to give him a boundary. But he didn't move at all actually. <laughs> the whole talk. Um, but it could be a coaching session. It, it could quite easily, if we took this session out and talked about uh, business development and sales training, it could be going through the sales process or the presentation process using the same tool. But we'll talk about coaching here. So you can go through and I can stop it at a certain place if needed, do some annotation, add some words and you can see I have already added one 36 minutes ago up here and I did that on the device and up it goes and then in a few moments it will be um, comment we come back to the device. So that's video-based reflection, a really simple idea. It really um, is an extension of what Silicon Coach used to be over many years of using video for technique analysis, but we think it's very powerful in the coaching area and coaching coaches as well. So any questions on BBR? Anything right now? Cool. Okay, Lauren. first design. Uh, mobile first design is as it says, designing for use on a mobile phone. Um, how many of you have smartphones now? Yeah, overwhelming majority. Um, <laughs> the concept of mobile first design is beautifully summed up in this quote. So you can't teach people everything they need to know. The best thing you can do is position them where they can find what they need to know when they need to know it. So how many of you are in a situation, you're at a cafe, you're talking to someone, and someone says, how much does a baby elephant actually weigh? Um, what are you going to do? You're going to have to Google it. Exactly right. Um, we are in an environment now where you're used to having answers immediately. You're used to going to your phone to find an answer straight out the gate. So a lot, of, um, a lot of design in the technical world now is actually done from the mobile phone app. It's much harder to take a big, beautiful website and split it down so that it fits on a phone. You actually have to approach it from the other way around. You have to look at, I want to make this fit on a phone first, and then I can add all this stuff to it later. So that's a very important thing to think about if you have content that you want to use in a mobile environment. You have to look at a lot of different aspects for, for your users and how they're going to engage with it. Um, from a brief example from a history standpoint, um, in 2007, we're going to go back. I want to welcome you to the age of smartphone. 2007, not that long ago, was it? That was when Apple introduced their first generation phone. This is the iPhone, I think it's a 2G, 
if I remember correctly. And I want to take you through some of the comments that um, critics had to say when they saw an iPhone for the first time. So I am not impressed with the iPhone. As a PDA user and a Windows mobile user, this thing has nothing on my phone. How the hell am I supposed to put appointments on the phone with no stylus or keyboard? And my favorite, touchscreen buttons, bad idea, this thing will never work. So this is the general um, representation of, this, of the critics version of an iPhone 10 years ago. Um, today, what you will notice is in 2007, phone usage was way down here. Um, in 2014, we had a crossover point. So this is a graph um, from the Morgan Stanley Research Institute that has looked at the number of global users when you're accessing the internet. So you'll notice 2014, there's a distinct crossover. Mobile phones are outstripping desktop use by a long shot, and that is a trend that no one really sees slowing down for the reasons that I described at the beginning. You're used to having it with you. You're not gonna carry your desktop around with you, are you? So this is something that um, as your content grows, you need to really be thinking about how can I use mobile phones to my advantage. It's not meant for every piece of content that you have, but it is worth considering for little snippets of information that you want to get out to your users quickly. So there are lots of benefits of what is referred to as M-learning. It's kind of like e-learning, but not because it's remote. Um, it's a great addition to a blended approach. So blended learning is basically mixing um, digital with face-to-face. -face. So the mobile phone is really great for that because you generally always have one. They're readily accessible, and it makes your content readily accessible as well. Internet coverage in New Zealand is consistently improving, and that means that even for your rural users, you're going to have the ability to get them at least some of your information. It can double time as a live resource. So say you are coaching a group of kids and you're out on the field. You could have a course that's been developed that will give you game exercises that you can use in real time. And walk you through why don't you try this particular exercise with your kids, tell you how to set them up, tell you how the rules work. Um, this can double as a resource for a referee if you're on the field. It is proven that graphic rich information is easier for people to absorb. This really, really counts when you are someone who has a learning disability or a visual impairment of some sort. Um, graphic rich information is phenomenal to use in conjunction with mobile content because what you are trying to read on a screen is generally smaller text than what you're used to. So including really good graphics is a really, really important concept that um, really works on a number of levels. Now, that's all the nice fluffy stuff. Um, I do want to let you know that there are some design restrictions that you need to consider when you're working with content on a phone. Number one, as I mentioned before, difficulty reading text on smaller screens. This is one you're probably all familiar with. If you've been on a poorly designed website and you have to zoom it in or you have to double click to get to read whatever it was you're trying to look at. Um, so that's something you want to take into account. When you're looking at content, cut it. Like, just go crazy and wipe as much of it out as you can so that you have that key point condensed down to one sentence. I want you to take paragraphs and turn them into a sentence if you can do it. That's my challenge. Constraints on presenting supporting media. So a lot of this is around the fact that um, imagery doesn't display the way you want it to on a phone. If, you're, if you've got a nice, beautiful landscape image, it's not going to work when you have a profile shot going on. So that's another bit to consider. I know we discussed using media-rich content, but you actually have to put thought into what you're chucking on there. You do have limited action. You don't have a mouse and a keyboard. So you're restricted to touch devices for the most part. Unless you've got an old Blackberry and you're still rocking that full screen keyboard, that's fantastic. But most people these days have got a touch phone and you need to accommodate for the fact that they can't right click on things to get more information. How do you access that side of your information? You're also dealing with increased cognitive load. Um, if you've had me in a training session before, you will understand that cognitive load is pretty much how hard your brain has to work to decode what you're seeing on the page. Um, PowerPoint presentations are great for decreasing the amount of cognitive load. You're using less text, nice big images, you get your point across really clearly. There have been a couple of studies that people have done in the last five or six years on the amount of cognitive load your users undergo when they're using a mobile phone and trying to learn something. It is actually significantly higher than someone who's using a desktop version or getting instruction face to face. 
That is usually because you're using a mobile phone when you're in a crowded environment, or hopefully not driving, but when you're in a car. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's going on behind that phone that you're also semi-paying attention to at the same time. So that makes it even harder for people to get that information on board. Bandwidth limits are the other big ones. So I mentioned internet's getting better, but it's not perfect everywhere. So um, a lot of people want to condense content down into videos, and that's something you do have to be cautious with when you're looking at um, translating everything into a mobile version. Are your users going to have data plans that are going to allow for video downloads at that rate for especially high-res videos? Now, ways you can work around those design restrictions. Um, are by including the concept of micro-learning and how you develop your content. Um, micro-learning is relatively new, but I do want to discuss with you the fact that it is about redesigning what you're using, not repackaging it. So I'm not going to take a whole book and just cut it into tiny pieces and then say, okay, there you go, that's great, because it's not going to cut, it's not going to cut the mustard. Like I mentioned before, you want to design it from the phone up. You're not going to put a whole textbook on a phone. Um, so really what you have to do is if you have a class or a course that you want in an online format, you have to take a hard look at it. Um, I want you to look at the content. Can you condense it? Can you make it shorter? You want to get your key points across as quick as you can and have enough room to put in a nice image to go with it to help add that level of detail that you're going to be cutting out. You want to use well thought out media to condense your text. So really think about the images that you're using. Does it make sense? Is it relevant? Um, stuff like this is really good um, to look at the content that you have currently as well. It's really nice to go back and revitalize older content that you're working with. Update the images that you're using. Keep your imaging consistent with current day processes and equipment for that matter. How fast does sports equipment kind of go out of style? Like you're going to have photos from two years ago. It's no good now because no one's using that particular type of padding. Now, combining media-rich environments with engaging interactions is a great way to get your users involved. And it's kind of that concept of gamification and getting that flow level going. You don't want to be sitting there reading stuff constantly and just looking at photos. It's not a picture book for a two-year-old. You're trying to get someone to learn something. So when you've got nice media-rich environments, think about your questions. What kind of questions can you ask that aren't going to be horrendously long but are still going to drive your points home? When you're looking at course development, from a beginner standpoint, you have to think about what do I want people to understand when they're finished with this course? Um, it's basically setting your course objectives. What do you want people to know? And when you're looking at your questions and what you're trying to write, you want them always to point back to those specific course requirements. It doesn't really matter about the fluffy stuff. No one cares about the fluffy stuff and that's a waste of your time. If you've got a key point you need to get across, Get it across to them and then ask them questions in a couple of different ways. The question can be about the exact same thing, but keep introducing it. That keeps you engaged with that content. Repetition is key with learning. It's a lot like riding a bike. You don't just automatically do it your first time out the gate, do you? <laughs> you have to keep doing it and keep it up. So in short, it is all about the content. Think about what you're using. Really, really look at it. And remember from, from micro learning, for taking stuff and putting it in bite-sized chunks, it is about redesigning it, not just cutting it into small pieces. Um, what I want to do at this point is actually show you what our course content can look like when it's used on a mobile phone. So my gold star um, example is New Zealand Rugby League. Um, they had a course that they wanted us to put into an online format, and they wanted it to be mobile friendly. Straight out the gate. There you are. Come back. Where'd you go? There you are. Um, so what they've done is actually taken their content and they've picked it apart and they've done a really, really nice job condensing everything down. So they took what would have been screeds of paper and put it into a video format. So what I want to show you guys is their concussion module and we'll just whip through it really quickly. Um, so what you'll see over here on your left is the online version, so this is the desktop version. And then what we have on the right is the mobile version. So this is the exact same content, exact same module. And what I'd like for really to, uh, what I would like for you to really understand is that this was all authored in the same platform. So we haven't done any additional work on either end. Um, it's all about design considerations from the beginning. So these are exactly the same if you look at it on an editing platform. It's just how it's displayed on the phone. 
So if I select concussion over here, and we'll reset it as well. So, right. So what we have is the exact same information displayed in two completely different ways. This is all about responsive design. If you've heard of that phrase, it's all about how does it fit as the screen gets smaller. So we've got a nice big image that kind of serves as an introductory point. And then we work our way through to the concussion video. Now, like I said before, you don't have the ability to use a mouse. So we focus on touch screen applications. So to work your way through the slides, you just press and drag, and that'll move you on to the next little bit. So what you'll see here is you've got a video on concussions that they've done a lovely job on. And if you're using this on a smartphone, you can rotate the screen to get a much better idea of kind of how that would work in widescreen view. Now, what you have next is a piece of text. Now, what I want you to really pay attention to, this is showing on an iPhone 5 size screen, replicate it. Um, but what I really want you to see is that this doesn't look like a lot, does it? Not on the desktop version. But when you look at it on a smartphone, actually the perfect fit. Like, that is about as much information as I would want to read on a slide. Um, this is actually a really, really great thing to keep in mind, even when you're working for content that goes on desktop. It's really nice to have your information condensed down like this anyway, from a regular standpoint. Um, it, it just helps with, with your user uptake, and it helps you with keeping that cognitive overload a little bit lower. So you see the same thing again here. And this slide is a really great example of how you can use text hierarchy to get your points across as well. So you've got a nice title, you have your basic information. This information in blue and bold is something that you really, really need to know. Um, using this type of approach, you need to use it sparingly. If you had everything in blue and bold, it's not gonna make the same, um, make the same point. So use it only when you really need something to, to really drive home on a point. Now, probably what you wanna see is how do the questions look? So what you have on the desktop version is something you're all familiar with. You select a button, hit check answer, and you get an idea for how you've done. On the smartphone, you will select and hit check answer for each question. And then you can work your way through to the rest of the information. We'll kind of skip through. So that is pretty much um, what a module on Bracken looks like in an online platform. So this is capability that we can all access. Your sites can all be set up to function in this fashion. Um, but what I do want to let you know is that if you need any assistance with looking at your content and determining is it going to work, how can I cut it down, that's what we're here for. We're here to help you with that. Um, we've done this quite a bit and we're really good about um, cutting the fluff out. So if you need any help with anything like that, just get in touch with um, your representative and we can definitely give you a heads up. Cool? Great. Um, any questions about that? God, you guys are smart. You're on it. Okay. Stan, you want the next one? I think that, that mobile thing that um, Donna was just talking about is, is, is amazing. And I, I, um, I just want to make sure you understand because you didn't all get up and cheer. I, that it's just the one, it's the one module. Okay, so you make module once and then you view it on a tablet, you view it on the desktop, you view it on an iPhone. So it's not like you have to make two versions of the same thing. So you can cheer later. So integration to the next one. This is just a short little topic, and, it, and it's, a, it's a big trend that we're seeing, uh, but it's happening out there all over the place. There's, there's so many different systems out there, and each person has their little pocket of information in the system, but the user wants one system. They don't want three or four loggers for one sport. Multiply that by a couple of sports that may be involved in a school or something. So integration is the big big buzzword at the moment. And there's no simple standards for integration. You know, system A, A, B, C, D don't all integrate with each other using the same language. Well, they use the same language. They don't use the same system. Um, so it's pretty much a case-by-case -case basis. 
and this is where we, we can really help you, and we're already doing with, um, with yachting and gym sports, who are looking at some cool new management systems, and we'll plug into that. So how, how may all that look? So for the user, the first one is single sign-on. So you have your system, could be demon management, customer relationship management, whatever you call it. It's a system that's managing all your people. They only need to sign on once into that system, and they will automatically get signed into Bracken as well. So what Bracken does is say, okay, well these are the jokers, we'll accept. It's been predetermined that these are good jokers, we'll accept the um, registration from that person automatically. If they're already a member, it just goes through to the module they wanted, and if they're not a member, it creates them and then takes them through to the module that they wanted. So that's the first part, the sign in once. What about actually doing modules? Well, from the, the, the central or the core system, they could just click on a link, they go into Bracken, they do the Bracken module with the interface that they're used to, and then when they're finished, the results get sent back. But this is all invisible. They, apart from some clever person tracking URLs or whatever, they don't know that they've changed systems. Okay, it's all seen. So if we look at it on the screen tonight, so this is a complete lock. This isn't anybody's member database screen. But it could be something like this. So there's a variety of courses. They haven't started anything. They've already been logged in with a single sign-in. There are no problems there. They click on a link, and they end up in bracket. They can do modules. They don't have to do them all. They can do some of them, a variety of them. But when they've finished that session and they go back, to the database, all the marks appear there. And then, once they're in the database, they can be used and compared with other things, um, subs or other courses that may have been done in other systems or whatever. And you've got the central, the central core of information in which the break and learning material makes up part of it. So that's all there is. From the user, it's really simple. From your end, concept is simple, but you work with us to get it done because most of the connections to the different systems are different technologies. Fortunately with uh, Gym Sports and Yachting, they're using the same Microsoft Dynamics 365 system, so uh, we'll be doing it once for both systems, which works out well. Any questions on integration? No? Yep. Okay, last one. Right. Excuse me, I brought my cheat sheet for this one. Right. Um, so I don't really have any slides to go through, but we are going to be discussing blended learning. Now, blended learning is pretty much just combining digital education with face-to-face -face versions. Now, what I would like to do with this little five-minute slot is discuss some ways that people are actually doing this in real life. Um, so if you're going to take notes, now is a great time. <laughs> so um, when you're working with blended learning, it's all about being creative. So how can I use the platform that I have? How can I use the resources that I have, the people, the equipment, um, whatever? How can you mix it all together? Some people are doing this in the format of e-portfolio. So an e-portfolio is an online portfolio. This is something that we see often when you need to prove evidence of something. You want to provide a body of work to say, Yes, I'm a fantastic coach. Here's an example. So with um, some of the wizards that we have, you can actually include an e-portfolio type of approach. You can ask them reflective questions about something that they have submitted as a piece of evidence. They can show you a video of them coaching students and give you an idea of things they can work on for next time. They can come back in a month and add another video to say, yep, I have worked on this, this, and this, but I still need to work on this you can comment back and forth and kind of help them grow their career. So e-portfolios are really great in that type of environment. Um, one of the ways that we've had people use our system is in group activity. So you wouldn't think that an online platform is something that you would use in group activity, but it's actually really, really beneficial to create a social learning environment. So some people will actually meet up in a pre-designated area. They'll bring their laptops or their iPads or whatever they want to access the, the module on and they work through the module with a group of people. So
So you're getting that social learning environment by bouncing questions off of the other person. You could actually format a module to suit that type of environment. So kind of like working through a PowerPoint without someone teaching. You have the ability to get them to bounce information off of one another, and they can submit an item at the very end to show you the work that they've done in that session. Um, this can also be used in terms of assessment, which kind of is out of the bounds of blended learning, but you can use this in a formative way, which is when you're doing something that cannot be measured. So how well am I presenting this to you? Um, that's kind of a formative assessment. A summative assessment is how many points out of 100 did I get right? So this type of system can be used in both ways. You can use those to kind of bounce off of one another, or you could just have one version versus the other. So formative assessment, you're a referee and you're supposed to handle a tough call. Here's a video of me doing this, and then you send that to an assessor who provides you with feedback on how that actually works. You can use it as a presentation tool, similar to PowerPoint. Um, work people through a module displaying it on um, a projector. Um, you can ask them questions and work your way through that. You can use it as a resource on site, like I mentioned with the mobile phone use. Um, you could have it put together as pre-reading for a face-to-face -face conference. Um, I know Cricut has a module that they use in this fashion, so they'll have their users work their way partially through a pathway, and then they stop them and say, look, now it's time for your face-to-face -face session. You have to go and do that, and then you come back to the module to finish it. So that's an excellent example of how you can blend that type of learning environment together. This, um, I just wanted to stop and kind of ask you guys if you have anything else that you use a system like this for that you could see it used for with your current programs. Do you, do you provide any type of a mixture of, um, of learning types in this fashion? Aside from my cookies. Can you see any of the examples that I gave as useful moving forwards? Sweet. Cool. So that's my very, very quick spiel on blended learning. I want to thank you guys for your time. Seriously, this has been great. Um, and like I said before, I really like feedback, so please tell me how I did. <laughs> I'm done. You're good. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's just um, a quick overview. The next part is obviously morning tea, and then we'll come back for a facilitated session. Um, your questions and uh, banter and carry on. Um, look, we will come back quarter past 11. So we'll have some food. Um, I think they were prepped for 11, so I'll go and sort that out. Um, but there'll be food and um, get yourselves organised, and quarter past 11 we'll, we'll kick off again. Thank you.